morning. I'm Ron Weich. I'm the Dean here at the University of Baltimore School of Law, and I'm going to offer a welcome uh, to this today's Steed Lecture, uh, which we will uh, hear from Professor Skinner shortly. Um, but I'm also pleased to offer a more uh, general welcome to the Wilson H. Elkins uh, Symposium on Republicanism. Uh, last night, I had the pleasure of hearing Professor Pettit um, and meeting some of you. Um, this Steed Lecture is actually an annual lecture at our law school a very prestigious lecture. Um, and ordinarily, uh, we fill the room with uh, interested participants uh, and, and uh, scholars and students. Of course, uh, at the moment, we can count ourselves on about two hands uh, in the room. But of course, we have the benefit of technology that enables many others to participate. And of course, one advantage is that people are participating from around the world. Uh, so that is a benefit. Uh, the reason that we are able to be here is the uh, hard work and uh, uh, entrepreneurship of my colleague, Professor Tim Sellers. Um, and you all know Tim, so I'm not gonna uh, belabor an introduction, except to say how very proud we are of him and his accomplishments and his stature in this field. Uh, you all know that Tim is uh, a longtime professor here at the University of Baltimore, and he is in fact a Regents Professor, which is a prestigious title awarded very uh, rarely uh, to uh, individuals in our university system of Maryland. Uh, he is currently, uh, in this year, uh, the, as, as well, the Wilson H. Elkins Professor. Um, he is Director of our Center on International and Comparative Law. And uh, you all know his accomplishments in the field, uh, as well as I do. Um, notably, he is an author of many volumes on uh, law and uh, the philosophy of law and comparative law. Um, and so we very much uh, appreciate and are proud of Tim's work and so glad that uh, he has brought us all together uh, on these days, and especially for this Steed Lecture. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean Weish, for that very kind and generous introduction. And I just want to take this moment and this opportunity to thank Dean Weish and the University of Baltimore School of Law for the support they have given uh, to scholarship over many years, but particularly to this uh, symposium, which I think is a wonderful event and which would not have happened without the support of the Dean and of the law school and the university generally. This is the first uh, in-person event uh, involving anyone from outside the university that has happened since the pandemic. So we are extremely honored and pleased uh, that this very distinguished group of people is coming to uh, bring us back into <laughs> the world of in-person scholarship or, or, or half, half in-person scholarship. I just want to say, uh, uh, this is the, Dean Weish mentioned that this is a, a, a lecture that has been given at the University of Baltimore for 26 years. It's our, our oldest endowed lectureship. And uh, it's something, uh, it's a, so for, in, in our terms, venerable. Uh, venerable and uh, highly respected uh, in, our, in our state, in our community. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're able uh, to, have, uh, to have a Steed Lecture <laughs> this year. Uh, I want to say just briefly something about Don, uh, John Sumner Steed, uh, for whom the lecture's named. Uh, John Steed was a British physician who served as a young doctor in the British Navy during the Second World War. Uh, in the North Atlantic convoy supplying uh, Britain from the United States. Uh, from that and other experiences, Dr. Steed developed a keen interest in global justice and in international cooperation, uh, and particularly in the conception of liberty and human rights and how they could be secured through the rule of law. Uh, in, in other words, the values that so animated the Atlantic Alliance during the Second World War. So I think it's particularly fitting that we have a British scholar, Professor Quentin Skinner, um, here to deliver the 26 Steed Lecture uh, on Republican liberty and fundamental rights. Now, before I introduce Professor Skinner, I want to note that because of restrictions put in place by uh, the United States government, Professor Skinner is in fact not physically in this room, uh, but rather on a huge screen behind me. So I'm now going to 
elevate Professor Skinner to the huge screen behind me. And you won't see me anymore, but you will see Professor Skinner. And uh, at the conclusion of his remarks, Professor Skinner will, will, will take your questions, uh, questions not only from people who are in the room, but also from those of you who are watching us remotely. Uh, so if you are a remote viewer and you have a question for Professor Skinner at the conclusion of the lecture, you should say so in the chat and we will bring you up onto the screen and you will be able to watch your, uh, you will be able to ask your question and all of us will be able to watch you as you do so because you're going to be alive. But uh, a second thing you should know uh, is that the actual lecture, the lecture part of the lecture has been pre-recorded um, to preclude any internet calamities. So now you see the coterminous uh, but remote Professor Skinner. In a moment, uh, you're gonna see Professor Skinner as he was quite recently, uh, but with subtle temporal differences. And then once again, uh, at the end, uh, the coterminous Professor Skinner will return uh, and take your questions. Uh, but before any of that occurs, he, he, he must be introduced. Uh, Professor Quentin Skinner is the Barber Beaumont Professor of the Humanities and co-director of the Center for the Study of the History of Political Thought at Queen Mary University in London. Uh, before going to London, he was Regis Professor of Modern History at the University of Cambridge and pro-vice chancellor of the University of Cambridge. His writings are vast and profound and his academic honors and his accomplishments so awesome and overwhelming that I shall not terrify his audience by mentioning them. Uh, but for the purposes of a group dedicated to the study of republicanism, as we are here, I'll draw particular attention to his inaugural lecture as Regis Professor, published as Liberty Before Liberalism in 1998. This is the 25th anniversary, or close enough to 25th anniversary, uh, of that lecture. And uh, also I think of my first meeting with Professor Skinner, who has been unfailingly kind and tolerant of younger and less accomplished scholars uh, in need of his encouragement. And since I think we are all in that category, I give the uh, floor to Professor Skinner, um, or rather briefly to my virtual self, who will then give the floor to Professor Skinner. So over to you. Professor Skinner. Uh, Professor Skinner, we're very honored to have you here and I give you the floor. Well, Tim, it's a joy to be here, except I'm sorry that I'm only in two dimensions. Well, my aim in this talk is to contrast a prevailing way of thinking about liberty with the previously hegemonic way of thinking about the same concept that's come to be known in recent discussions as the Republican theory of liberty. May I begin though by recalling what I've just described as the prevailing way of thinking, at least in Anglophone legal and political thought, towards which I must admit there is a bias in this talk. To which I should add that that's not because I think the Anglophone tradition is necessarily the most important one, it's simply the one I'm best equipped to discuss. Let me just mention two classic statements of what I'm calling the prevailing view. One, Isaiah Berlin in his essay, Two Concepts of Liberty. One of the concepts Berlin considers is that freedom or liberty is the name of a kind of positive moral achievement, a view familiar to us from the works of Hannah Arendt, for example, recently restated by Charles Taylor. But Berlin sets that view aside in favor of claiming that liberty is best understood in negative terms simply as an absence of moral or physical coercion, and is thus a state of being free from hindrance or interference. The other statement I'd just like quickly to recall, a most celebrated work, is John Rawls at the beginning of A Theory of Justice. To speak of liberty, he claims, is always to refer to the same triadic relation, an agent, an action, and an end. So agents are free when they are unimpeded from the pursuit of an end. So in summary, 
Berlin and Rawls are agreeing that liberty consists in absence of hindrance or interference. Now, by contrast with that orthodoxy, I want to re-examine what I want to call the neo-Roman or juridical theory of liberty. Now, this is none other than the theory that Philip Pretty brilliantly uncovered for us in his book, Republicanism, 1997, and which he called the Republican theory. And Philip's study has quite rightly become a classic, so that's the name that has stuck. But one of the points I want to make is that from an historian's point of view, that is misleading. It's true that the theory at issue does partly have a Republican provenance. It stemmed in part from classical Republican thinking, as revived in Renaissance political theory by such writers as Machiavelli in the Discorsi, and later in the Anglophone tradition by such avowed admirers of Renaissance Republicanism as James Harrington in Oceana, Algernon Sidney in the Discourses Concerning Government. However, to think of their view of civil liberty as inherently connected with Republicanism is a mistake. The fact is that until sometime in the late 17th century, every European thinker who wrote about civil liberty espoused what Philip calls the Republican view. Although a large majority of them would have been horrified to be described as Republicans. And certainly, this is the key point, did not derive their arguments from Republican sources. So it seems to me that if we want to acquaint ourselves with this best statement, as you might say, of this misnamed theory, the first question we need to ask is, from what sources was it originally and basically derived? Well, the answer is that it's received its classic in both senses and most influential formulation in what I must say I've come to think is perhaps the most influential work of legal and political theory in the Western tradition, namely the digest of Roman law. So I'd like now to turn for my exposition to that most essential source. Well, within the digest, the analysis of the concept of liberty appears in the section entitled of the status of men and women, beginning of book one. Well, that source never ceased to be invoked, but it's crucial that its definitions and arguments were later incorporated almost word for word into the earliest and most influential compilation of common law. And that is the massive treatise De Legibus, traditionally ascribed to William de Bracton and dated to the mid 13th century. Now, the reason why this matters is that Bracton's compilation had a formative impact on the common law tradition as a whole. I need not speak too parochially here because the common law tradition um, prominent in Great Britain, later became crucial also in the American colonies. But it must be admitted that it was never of formative significance in continental European legal thought. However, the discussion of liberty is one of many instances in which the common law is in fact wholly dependent on Roman law. And as we shall see, Bracton's common law analysis is almost entirely copied out of the digest of Roman law. So the point is this, the version of the theory I want to concentrate on, whether derived from Roman or canon law, was for centuries espoused over most of Western Europe and then subsequently in the American colonies um, as the palmary way of laying out the account. Well, Bracton begins De Legibus by citing the digest for the view, I quote, um, that the whole of law is concerned either with persons or things or actions. He then adds, still quoting the Dysonus, I quote again, that since persons are of the greatest importance because all laws are established for them, we must first consider persons and their status. Well, that clears the way for what Bracton next describes, still quoting the Digest, as the principal and briefest division of the status of persons, namely, that all men and women are either free persons, liberi homines, or else they are slaves. So the essential claim being made is that if you wish to understand the concept of liberty, here's the point, what you basically need to grasp is what does it mean to be a slave? 
Well, on the concept of slavery, the digest has two contrasting points to make, and I need to take them in turn. First, the digest lays down, and I quote Bracton quoting it, is slavery is an institution by which contrary to nature, contra naturam, someone is subjected to the dominion of someone else. Notice there the strongly anti-Aristotelian view of slavery. Slavery, we are being told, is not supported by the law of nature. It is only an institution supported by the Euskentium. By the way, much later, that provides the basis of Lord Mansfield's celebrated judgment on slavery in the Somerset case, 1772. All that Mansfield argued was that if slavery is supported only by the Euskentium, then it is not supported by common law. The implication, which he didn't draw, is of course it cannot therefore be legal in England. Okay, to repeat, according to the Digest, slavery is an institution by which someone is subjected to the dominion of someone else. Now, the vital term here is obviously dominion, and that is indeed the central term of Roman constitutional thought. I know no definition of this word in Latin, um, but it had two meanings, as dictionaries like to say, or rather it was used in two distinct ways in Roman law. The word is either used to refer to property or to power. Now here, as I put it, the digest is telling us that a slave is someone who is subjected to the dominion of someone else. So here dominion can only mean power. To be a slave is to be subjected to the power and hence the mere arbitrary will of someone else. You could put the same point differently a slave is someone never able to act entirely according to their own will. Whatever actions a slave performs will always be the outcome both of their own volition and the allowance of the dominus or master to whom their will is subject. Slaves are able to act only because of the silently, or could be explicitly expressed, permission of a master who retains power to forbid or prevent them from acting should they choose. So a master at all times possesses silent power. Okay, as we've seen, the jurists lay it down that the fundamental distinction in the law of persons is that everyone is either free or a slave. So now you understand what it means to be a slave, you can see what it means to be free. To be a slave is to be subject to the will of another and hence never able to act according to your own will. So to be free must be not to be subject to the will of anyone else and hence always able to act as you choose. And that's exactly what the digest says. The relevant dictum comes from the jurist Florentinus who states, I quote, the liberty of a free person, he's saying the libertas of a liber homo consists in being able to exercise their natural power of being able to live as they want. The only systematic limitation on their freedom of action is said to arise from the fact, I'm still quoting, that they may sometimes be prohibited by law or prevented by force. So you could put the same point another way, as the jurists in fact do. A free person is someone who does not have a dominus. Or you could say, as we do, to be, or we used to, we don't talk like this anymore, but to be free is to be your own master. Right, at this point, I need to interpolate something. The writers on neo-Roman liberty eventually divide at this juncture over the, rule of the, the, the role of the will. Some later exponents of the theory, among whom John Locke is the most celebrated in the Anglophone tradition, maintain that the mark of a free person is not that they do what they want, it is that they do what reason dictates. That was the, the view that Hume was later to challenge and that Kant seeks to reinstate. For Locke, anyone who manages to use their reason to control their passions can be said to act freely. Anyone who instead acts in Locke's phrase as, notice his phrase, a slave of the passions is said to act in a way that expresses not liberty, but license. 
Right, but for the jurists, by contrast, the only question is whether you're free to make autonomous choices. They're not interested in policing the choices we make or moralizing the idea of freedom of action. So in the legal text, this distinction, later so important in the Christian tradition, between liberty and license, it just makes no appearance. There then is the basic distinction in Roman law between the slave and the free. But as I began by saying, the jurists have a second and a complicating point to make. While they lay it down that to be a slave is to be subject to the will of another, they go on to argue that the converse does not hold. It is possible to be subject to the will of another without being a slave. And it's here that they introduce the category of being sui juris, that's to say, able to act in your own right. They argue that there are various classes of person who are definitely not slaves are not fully free persons, because in some area of their life, they're not able to act in their own right, but remain subject to someone else. Now, as that notion was taken over into common law, the category expanded into being a very extensive one. And among those who are said to be not fully sui juris are a majority of people, women, especially wives, children, more especially wards, as well as anyone who is judged, as they say, not to be sane. Well, those are obviously legal distinctions, uh, and they don't interest the classical Republican exponents of the neo-Roman liberty view at all. Those writers habitually work simply with the distinction between being subject to the will of another, and hence free, and um, I'm saying not being subject to the will of another, and hence free, and being subject, and hence a slave. However, the objection to that simpler framing, which began to be vociferously voiced as soon as the institution of slavery came to be really questioned, is that it dilutes the category of slavery to a morally outrageous degree. And it must be admitted that in the heyday of the neo-Roman way of thinking about liberty, that dilution undoubtedly occurred. And I'm afraid the most glaring example is the way the revolt of the American colonies from British rule in the 1770s was legitimized as it was wholly in neo-Roman terms. I think you could say the colonists and their supporters reasoned somewhat as follows. We're being taxed without representation by the British Parliament, but that's to say that the law we're being commanded to obey is one which our representatives have not consented to. So the demand for taxes is being made to us in the form of an exercise of arbitrary power. But to be subject to arbitrary power is what it means to be a slave. And that breaches our natural rights so basically as to justify revolution. But even at the time that argument caused outrage, I quote one of the pioneering anti-slavery campaigners, Dean Tucker of Bristol. Bristol, of course, the great slaving city in Britain. The colonists, he says, they may have a case about taxation, but it cannot take the form of the claim that someone like George Washington is a slave, when in truth he is not only a free person, but he actually owns a number of slaves. Five, according to Tucker. I don't know if that figure is accurate. Now, I, that dilution was, of course, an outrage, but you do not find it in the Roman law text. They agree that some people, most obviously children, are not free, although they're not slaves. But what they say is, well, obviously, then there must be something more that, that distinguishes free persons from slaves, not just that slaves are unfree. So what is it? Well, the answer is obvious. And the jurists present it in their opening discussion of servitude in the digests. Slaves are not merely persons subject to power and hence to the will of someone else. Of slaves, we can also say that they are persons who have been, and, and I quote, reduced to being our dominion. The Latin says, in dominium nostrum ready gunter. And here, dominium can only mean property. They've reduced to being our dominion, reduced to being our property. So the definition of slavery that we extract from Roman law is that to be a slave is to be subject to the arbitrary will of someone else in consequence of being in their ownership. Well, 
the Roman jurists conclude their analysis of freedom and slavery at that point. I focused on it because it seems to me at once the clearest, and this is much more important, by far the most influential statement, of what I'm calling the neo-Roman or juridical view of civil liberty, which because largely of Roman law became hegemonic in European legal theory until it began to be questioned in the late 17th century by a number of writers on natural jurisprudence. Uh, and especially by Pufendorf and his followers, and later very influentially in Britain by Blackstone in his commentaries, who draws extensively on Pufendorf. By the way, there's a complex story to be told here about how the neo-Roman view came to be put under pressure at this time, so that by the end of the 18th century, it was almost universally set aside in favour of the now hegemonic view that freedom is just absence of interference. I don't have time to go into that story here, I'm afraid, uh, but I'd be very willing to take it up in discussion if anyone wanted. Well, it, it seems to me that the neo-Roman view, as stated in the digest, is pretty clear and unambiguous. But that being so, I find something surprising in the debate that's arisen since it's begun to be re-examined and revived by historians and philosophers in recent decades. The surprise is, to me, that among those who've criticized this revival, the structure of the neo-Roman theory has constantly been misunderstood. Now, here's how I think the misunderstanding has arisen. As you've seen, the jurists in effect have two accounts of how you can suffer a loss of liberty. You can be impeded from acting, as Florentinus said, by law or by force, or else you can be rendered subject to the arbitrary will of another in the manner of a slave. So we do need to ask about the relationship between, and the importance relatively of, losing your freedom through subjection and losing it through legal or coercive interference. Now, as I began by saying, the philosopher who's done the most important work to revive and defend the neo-Roman view has been Philip, Philip Pettit. However, even Philip in his original work of exhumation in republicanism, it seemed to me to misstate the answer to the question I've just raised, because he said it doesn't need to be asked. He declared then, I quote, um, uh, freedom must be equated with non-domination. So acts of interference are nothing more than factors that may condition liberty, but they don't render you unfree. Now that left an opening for his opponents to retort. I hear I quote a recent article by Professor Talis that I quote, it seems perverse to insist that interference is never sufficient for a loss of freedom. As these critics argue, I'm afraid rightly, it seems an obvious deprivation of liberty if someone restricts my movement without my consent. For example, I mean, this is Talisa's rather strange example, by handcuffing me while I'm lying asleep. So these critics conclude that for a satisfactory account of freedom, the concept of non-domination and the more familiar idea of freedom as absence of interference are somehow going to have to be combined, combined. And I must admit that in my own book, Liberty Before Liberalism, I tended to agree. However, it's come to me to seem that at this point, both Philip and his opponents didn't quite get right the structure of the neo-Roman view, although Philip has since restated his case in a way that fully answers his critics. But with the original formulation, um, it seems to me that there's a failure to acknowledge what I'm taking to be fundamental in the distinctions the Neo-Romans make. And the fundamental distinction here is between those conditions which have the effect of taking away our standing as free persons, liberi homines, and those which, although limiting our libertas, our freedom of choice and action, leave our standing as free persons untouched. A free person who suffers some act of interference certainly forfeits some liberty of action, but the constraint does nothing to take away their standing as a free person, that's to say someone not subject to the arbitrary will of others. And the distinctive Roman claim, the neo-Roman claim too, and here's the core of it all, is that this is what matters for freedom. The claim is, you could say, freedom isn't basically a predicate of actions, 
It's basically the name of a status, that of persons who are their own masters. That's to say that of people who are capable of living as they please in virtue of not being subject to the will of others. Why does that most basically matter? Here's the point. If you are not a free person, you're never able to act freely because your actions will always be the outcome, not merely of your own will, but at the same time of the silently expressed permission of the person to whom you're subject. So what neo-Romanism is all about is this. Freedom is a will-will relationship. And what matters is, do you have an autonomous will? Okay, there's my exposition. And I now want to turn to the view about rights that came to be associated with this view of liberty. Because here too, I have to say, it seems to me that some confusion has arisen in recent debates. Well, some exponents of the neo-Roman theory of liberty operate without a conception of rights at all. That's largely true in the Renaissance and early modern period of those who took their understanding of liberty from the Roman moralists and historians, as for example, Machiavelli so influentially did in the Discorsi on Livy's History of Rome. Machiavelli could have spoken of rights, diritti, as his scholastic contemporaries did, but he never once uses that vocabulary. For Machiavelli, as for his most enthusiastic admirers in the English Revolution, like Nedham, the freedom of people in a republic is not a right, it is the consequence of an exercise of civic virtue. However, most exponents of the neo-Roman view in its Anglophone heyday, I mean, that's to say in the English revolution of the 17th century, in the American revolution of the late 18th century, most of these people were contractarian political writers. So their starting point is with an imagined state of nature, in which everyone equally enjoys liberty because no one is in a state of subservience to anyone else. Everyone is equally free. Furthermore, everyone is said to enjoy this equal liberty as a matter of right. It's a right of nature given to you by God as the author of nature. And they're quoting Price, for example. So for these writers, the question of whether a state, a given state is legitimate depends on the extent to which it upholds these natural rights, which were taken to be inalienable. That's because to infringe these rights by the exercise of arbitrary power is held to be equivalent to taking away the natural liberty of the people and thus to rendering them slaves. For a classic statement of that view in the English Revolution, you can turn to John Locke, or in the American Revolution to such writers as John Dickinson, or such English supporters of the colonists as Richard Price. During the English Revolution, however, a more prominent strand of opposition to the allegedly arbitrary behavior of the Stuart monarchy came from the constitutional lawyers, and most influentially from Sir Edward Cook, the lawyer who drafted the Petition of Right of 1628. That was the petition to the Crown in which Parliament, in an epoch-making moment, formally accused the king of exercising despotic power by taking away the lives of citizens by the use of martial law, their liberty by the refusal of habeas corpus, and their property by using prerogative powers to tax without consent of parliament. The case made by the common lawyers was that the use of such arbitrary power to take away life, liberty, and property constitutes a tyrannical denial of a citizen's rights and liberties. But they never describe these rights in the manner of Milton or Locke as natural rights given to us by God as the author of nature. They see them as having a completely different prominence and a completely different character. Common lawyers like Cook define law as custom and hence focus on precedents that have become enshrined as law through being tested by time, a test that's held to disclose the law's enduring social usefulness. The common lawyers never deny that some of the legal rights that arise in this way are so basic that to lose them would be to forfeit your status as a free person. Rather, indeed, they emphasize that this is so, and they begin to underline that point by describing these rights as 
fundamental rights. Now that vocabulary was first introduced, I've done some research on this and I find it introduced with extraordinary suddenness by the parliamentary opposition to the British monarchy just before the outbreak of the English civil wars. And then when the British constitution was settled after the revolution of 1688, these rights uh, appear in the so-called Bill of Rights of 1689, which remains statutory in the UK. But here too, they're never described as natural rights. The list of the British Bill of Rights is a social construction, avowedly so. It's offered as an encapsulation of what members of one specific political association have come to recognize over a long period of time as essential to the fulfillment of what they take to be their basic purposes. So the status of being a free person, what English common law used to call a freeman, thus comes to be equated with the capacity to exercise what the Bill of Rights describes as, and I'm quoting, our ancient and undoubted rights and liberties, which King James had attempted to subvert and extirpate by following arbitrary and illegal courses. Well, there's the outline I want to give of the view of rights that came to be associated with Neo-Romanism. And there's my account of the underlying Neo-Roman view. Well, that's in a way the end, except that you might say, well, so what? Does any of that really matter for us here and now? And I think, yes, it really does. And what I want to do is to draw to a close by what I see and what I want to underline as seeing to be the contemporary value of the theory I have sketched. I just want to make three points. One picks up what I've just been talking about. I think the Neo-Roman model offers us a way of thinking about rights that seems to me well worth exploring further. Among contemporary political philosophers, natural or human rights, as we've come to call them, continue to be widely treated as universal moral demands that everyone can equally make upon everyone else. But one objection to that approach, for which I must admit I have sympathy, is that it's difficult to prevent the list of alleged human rights from inflating into a description of everything we judge necessary for a good life. And I think it's an understandable reaction in the literature to propose, as some have, I mean, think of Griffin or Poggi, that the idea of honoring human rights should instead be limited to that of furnishing a number of basic goods that could feasibly be provided within existing institutional frameworks. But of course, one problem with that approach is that it valorizes institutional frameworks that we have as if it's only proper to give them precedence when surely that's what has to be shown. Now, as some political theorists have begun to emphasize, this analytical stalemate is one from which neo-Romanism can rescue us. I'm thinking here in particular of the important recent work of Professor Lena Haldanius. As Haldanius points out, a useful way of thinking about such rights might be to conceive of them as fundamental liberties, to equate them, that is, with the basic rights that come to be valued within specific political associations over time and need to be secured if we're to be prevented from becoming subject to the will of anyone else in respect of these fundamental liberties. So the outcome of adopting that approach would be to compile a list of co-enjoyable rights that all legitimate governments would need to make it their business to uphold against any possible interference. I, I really think that's a conception that deserves to be further explored. A second value I see in the neo-Roman theory is that it restores the connection between securing individual liberty and upholding democratic government. I think it hasn't been sufficiently noted that one outcome of the triumph of the liberal view of freedom was the severing of these links. I mean, Isaiah Berlin, for example, explicitly declares in Two Concepts of Liberty, uh, and I quote, there is no necessary connection between individual liberty and democratic rule. Liberty consists in not being interfered with by others, and so is concerned with the area of control, not its source. You might enjoy more freedom under an enlightened despot than under the purest democracy. 
Well, it's becoming increasingly clear that that line of thinking is dangerous to democracy. Think, for example, of the reaction of some libertarian commentators to the current pandemic. They seem to consider all laws inimical to liberty because the imposition of law involves interference. So the legitimacy even of democratic imposed laws comes to be questioned. But by contrast, the neo-Roman theory of liberty insists that you can never hope to live as a free person except under a constitution in which two conditions are satisfied. One is, of course, you must be secured in the enjoyment of your fundamental rights. But the other is that by a process of equal representation, we should each be able to make our voice heard with others equally in creating the laws under which we live. What we've got to do is to have a system, it can only be democracy, in which laws are not regarded as mere constraint but rather as expressions of our represented will. The reason for this latter requirement is that if the laws do not express my will, at least by representation, I'm left subject to the will of others, the very definition of unfreedom. So I have to say that seems to me to give any Democrat an almost automatic preference for a neo-Roman view of liberty, as opposed to the prevailing tendency to speak only about non-interference with rights. The more that you insist on non-interference as the primary value, the more liberalism tends to mutate in a direction that can begin to look awfully like anarchism. I come to my third and final observation. This for me is the most important. As I've been stressing all along, a crucial value of the neo-Roman theory stems from its distinctive emphasis on the fact that you can be unfree even in the absence of any act of interference. To put my point polemically, if you insist on taking the view that freedom consists in non-interference, you can hardly fail to be imperceptive about some increasingly troubling instances of silent power. Consider, for example, the extent to which de-unionized workforces, or even worse, undocumented aliens currently live at the mercy of employers who have power to dismiss them at will. Or consider how the widespread economic dependence of women continues to limit their freedom of choice, leaving them vulnerable to partners whom they lack the resources to escape. My point here is the loss of liberty suffered in such circumstances need not stem from overt acts of coercion or interference. It already stems from the mere fact of living in subjection to the arbitrary will of someone else with a virtually unavoidable consequence that you're going to have to make very sure that you don't do anything liable to cause them offence. I'd like to add here that Philip Pettit uh, has powerfully emphasised that these considerations apply not merely at the person-to-person -person level, but also in relations of states, uh, and indeed foreign corporations and states. A state or corporation which chooses to, an invest, to invest in an economically disadvantaged country will always be in a position to exact special privileges, favorable tax rates, easy environmental regulations, perhaps a lowering of environmental standards. A powerful corporation or state will never need explicitly to demand such favors. The nature of their relationship to the country in question, which is that of domination and subservience, is going to be enough for them to get their way. So the freedom of action of the dominated community is taken away by silent power. But it seems to me that the most insidious threat to our freedom, which current liberal theory is especially ill-equipped to address, arises from the growth of surveillance by corporations as well as states. I don't want to sound paranoid, but this form of silent power is worrying. How should we react, for example, to the current business models of digital and social media companies? They provide free services that enable them covertly to acquire swathes of data about your personal preferences. So you're left subject in an important domain of your life to an unaccountable form of power, which may or may not be useful or benefit, and over which you have absolutely no control. Now this danger, of course, has been criticized, but usually, uh, as an invasion and affront to privacy. But I'm saying that misses the neo-Roman point. It's the mere fact of living 
under such a form of power that constitutes an affront not just to privacy, but to your standing as a free person. You may, of course, think the benefits outweigh the costs, but what the neo-Roman analysis asks you to consider is, is it wise? Because you don't know what could happen. Well, I hope the moral of my story is now very clear, and here I really do draw to a close. The moral is, I think, that one goal we should be setting ourselves is that of insisting on our status as free persons in the best neo-Roman style. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Professor Skinner, for your uh, gripping and uh, wholly convincing remarks. Uh, we have time for questions, both from those here present and from the audience who are watching on Zoom. If you are watching by Zoom and have a question, please put your question into the chat. We can then make your face visible to Professor Skinner and to us so that you can ask your question. And with that, I uh, give you again, Professor Skinner. So those of you who have questions, raise your hand. I think I see one. This, this is a question from Professor Philip Pettit. Well, it's, it's thank you very much, Quentin. Um, just one, one. I mean, I the, the three points you mentioned at the end, I absolutely applaud, and um, I think we're really on the same page there. Um, you are absolutely right about the neo-Roman tradition, as far as I can see. I mean, I'm always a consumer of history, but not a producer of history, and I wholly defer to you. Um, I called it the Republican tradition, I suppose, simply because it connects with uh, with live traditions. I mean, and it connects with the American Revolution, after all. But just one point I'd quite like to uh, ask you about. When you identify a difference between us, and that was already a difference um, back in 1997, when you gave the lecture and I wrote the book, I think, where you were emphasizing that um, interference, even if it wasn't, so to speak, subjection to the will of another, <clears throat> as in taxation or in imprisonment, could actually be represented as an offense against freedom. And I wanted to hold the line and say that, well, there was a difference. I actually came, as you may remember, really under your influence to recognize that it was free personhood that mattered. And I think a few years later, I, I certainly made that move. Yeah. Uh, very much under your influence. And I think in the neo-Roman tradition, it's the status of free person of the matters. And being subject to taxation, when it's democratically controlled, to go to the second point that you mentioned in the, in the conclusion, is not, of course, being subjected to an arbitrary will, and in that sense, does not render you a non-free person. So I think we absolutely are now very much on the same page as I think you are, uh, as you. There's just one point in passing you mentioned, which um, I may have misheard, but um, I feel bold enough, so to speak, to differ, even though it's a, a matter really of history in which you are so infinitely more qualified. And that is your remark about the taxation in reference to Dean Tucker. Because mm -hmm. when I read people, and you originally were the one who direct me to those authors, uh, like Richard Price, but in particular, Joseph Priestley. Uh, Priestley has a speech, if I remember correctly, that goes like this. What is the complaint of the Americans? And he says, it is not that they are taxed for one penny. This is in reference to the Stamp Act, I guess. Or was some of, no, rather the taxation introduced after 1766. And um, 
It's not because they're taxed one penny, he says. It is because the power that taxes them for one penny can tax them for their last penny. In other words, it's the fact that the power in question of taxation is a power that the Americans play no part in controlling. In that sense, it's a discretionary power. It's an arbitrary power in the sense of the term at that time. And they are therefore subjected thereby to the will of another. Now, I absolutely agreed with uh, Dean Tucker, if I may put it that way, that, of course, it was extraordinary um, hyperbole on the part of the American colonists or their defenders like Priestley to uh, talk about, as, for example, uh, Richard Price did, about the Americans as the most abject slaves that ever walked the earth in the presence of actual chattel slavery in their, uh, in their colonies. Uh, I agree entirely with that, but I, I do think that these people were not objecting to taxation as such as an offense against freedom. It was because it was uncontrolled taxation, taxation by a power that they played no democratic or other controls in, in actually uh, containing. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Philip. Um, I, th I, I think actually I have much to say, and some of it is in my heart, and of course the influence goes quite the other way. Um, and um, republicanism was a masterwork. Uh, I actually want to say two things by way of response. Uh, and one stems from my sorrow that I'm not physically with you. I, I heard, of course, the wonderful lecture yesterday evening, marvelous performance. Um, and that, if I had been live today, would have caused me to say something different just at the beginning. May I just get that out of the way first of all, because um, when I watched myself giving my lecture, I thought, well, how extraordinary, you, you've misstated what happens in rules. Skinner, you've misstated what happens in rules. Because I looked again, I'm now on, um, look, I even made a note about this, I'm on page 203 of rules. Um, and he enunciates the following McCallum, uh, a, a Berlin-like account of uh, how we should think about freedom. On the same page, he articulates the Republican view because he says that in respect of basic liberties, freedom is not absence of restraint or interference, but takes the form of protection from the possibility of interference. <laughs> but that, of course, is the Republican view. So in one paragraph, Rawls states, the two opposed views, as if they can simply be uh, made interchangeable. It's a very extraordinary page uh, to go back to. Uh, and I think that what you have to say about rules on liberty is he, he's in a muddle. It, it's just a muddle. OK, that's just to get that um, uh, off my conscience. And let me come to this question where I think I have misspoken this afternoon. Um, the objection to the Stamp Act, which, of course, is what's really at issue here in 1766, is that the colonies, of course, had their own legislatures and they were the taxing authority. And that was taxation by consent because they were representative assemblies in all the 13 colonies. The British Parliament had never imposed a tax on the American people recognizing that they tax themselves locally. But uh, Britain faced bankruptcy after the end of the, the Seven Years' War and was attempting to um, raise funds by all possible means. And they decided to tax the colonies, uh, which they had never done. Now, the objection was twofold. One is, um, I, I want to say it is to the fact that there is taxation. This is unheard of. And on the other hand, of course, you're right, Philip, that it's not the act of taxing that they are objecting to, but the fact that they are facing a parliament which is imposing taxation in the form of an exercise of arbitrary will. Because there's no consent to that, so that 
the, the law which they're required to obey is not one which in which they can see themselves as uh, represented. So they haven't consented to this. It is therefore an act of tyranny. And that was the immediate response. I mean, especially from the, the, the Pennsylvania farmer. I mean, those wonderful letters of Dickinson. Um, now, something which um, I know you know, of course, is that the, the British made a very interesting move, which was that they immediately received, uh, they, they um, rescinded the um, Stamp Act. But in rescinding it, they explained that they had the right to reimpose it. And that was really their fatal move, because that is to say, we have rights of arbitrary power over the colonies. And that in respect of a fundamental right. I mean, whether you think this is an inalienable natural right or just a fundamental constitutional right, this is confiscating property. And that is an infringement of a fundamental or on the another analysis, a, a natural right. So that's what they want to say um, about taxation, I think. Um, and, and of course, you're right that when the, the British supporters say, yes, but uh, it, since they are faced with an arbitrary power to which they have not consented, they are slaves. And of course, that's what causes the furore, uh, especially against Price. And Wesley writes uh, an extraordinary pamphlet of denunciation uh, of Price um, called Thoughts on Slavery, in which he says, look, you haven't got a clue what you're talking about. You're talking about the most horrible institution in our world. And you're just bandying this name around, and this is just disgusting. I mean, of course, I have to say that's right. Now have some questions from the people who are watching us remotely. And uh, the first one I think is from Professor Isabel Trujillo. So I, can you get Professor Trujillo? Thank you very much indeed. It was a really pleasure to, to listen your lecture, really. And I thank also Tim for inviting me. My question was written in the chat, if I don't speak uh, properly. Uh, it is about the arbitrary part uh, of the definition of uh, uh, um, liberty in the Roman style, as you uh, as you told us, uh, because uh, uh, um, uh, being a status, uh, uh, liberty was uh, the subjection to a power, but uh, uh, precisely uh, because there were institutions in the use gentium or in the use civile, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, causing the uh, uh, the status of that uh, people being a slave. Then I, I think that uh, uh, if we define um, liberty as uh, not being subjected to an arbitrary power, we are including a, 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 a connotation that is not in the very Roman style a way of uh, thinking liberty. Uh, uh, this is my, 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 my first question. The second one uh, is about uh, um, the, um, the, the difference between liberty in, uh, in singular and liberties in the plural. Uh, and my question is about uh, if you think that uh, liberties is a modern concept. We are, uh, uh, because we are changing the, sub, the, the content of uh, liberty, we can also divide uh, uh, liberty in uh, different uh, 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 ways of uh, uh, um, behaving. Thank you so much, thank you. Well, thank you. Where are you speaking from, Isabel? Uh, from Palermo, Sicily, in Italy. Ah, ecco. Che fortunata. Yes, I am. <laughs> I am Spanish, but I am living here and I, I, I am very lucky. lucky. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, 
um, my goodness, the Normans brought Roman law to Sicily, didn't they? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm, I'm hearing two queries in this very interesting set of remarks. Uh, and the first is, is about arbitrariness. And the second is about liberty and liberties. So let me address these in turn. Um, in the Roman version, in the Latin version, that's to say, of the theory that I've been trying to give an exposition of, the word is uh, arbitrium. Um, and in Latin, of course, arbitrium just means the will. <laughs> um, but in the law, what is being objected to is that this is not a legal relationship if it is simply a relationship of wills. That's to say, the law cannot take the form of just somebody's arbitrium. So this is extra legal. Mm -hmm. um, and hence, when it gets translated, the term that gets used is, I mean, we've, we've never gone very far in translating that Latin word. We just say arbitrary, meaning the mere will. It's just someone's mere will. But that is the Rome, that is the Roman thought in the digest that subjection to someone's mere will, let us say that, subjection to arbitrium uh, is um, subjection to a form of silent power. Because um, insofar as that will could operate, um, you can be prevented from acting. But if, you, if it could always prevent you from acting, then it's a kind of controlling power. That's to say you've always got to reckon with it. It's not counterfactual. It's real power, but it's silent power. And that is because it's not a legal power. It's just someone's will. So what you found is that you are subjectum, subjectum arbitrio. You are subject to their will. Uh, and so that is the whole accusation. If you're subject to their will, then you're not a free person. You're not a liber homo. Uh, homo, of course, meaning man or woman. They would never say person. That's a um, that's a that's a sort of theatrical notion because that's personation always. Um, and in in English we don't have a, a word, nor do we in Italian for man or woman. We have to say person. But homo means man or woman. And of course in Roman law, there's it's a, it's not a binary either. There's men and there's women and there's other things in between. They're extremely uh, keen on all of that. So it's the 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 free as we would have to say, person subject to the will of another is now a slave. That is what it is to enslave someone. Now, I'm not sure if I completely followed the, the way in which you want to make this distinction between liberty and liberties. Um, of course, it becomes very important in one version of the exposition that I was giving, which is the discussion of fundamental rights. Because... Fundamental rights are historically grounded. They are guaranteed by the Constitution over time. There's a large number of them, and they relate especially to, um, to life uh, in, in Magna Carta in the English law, 1215, already life and in, imprisonment without trial, uh, habeas corpus, um, and no confiscation of goods. You can already hear life, liberty, and property sounding beneath the surface there. These are liberties, of course, they're in the plural. But if you take away any of them, you have taken away someone's status as a liber homo. You've taken away their liberty because liberty is the status of a liber homo. And what it is to be a liber homo is to have all of these fundamental rights fully protected. A failure on the part of the state fully to protect them is an act of tyranny. So um, the liberty liberties dis uh, distinction is not strong at all for them because they think that what it is to be a, a liber homo, a, a free person, is to have these lib libertates, is to have is to have that set of libertates, not any old libertates, but but these fundamental ones. Thank you so much. The uh, next question is from Professor Stefan Kirsta. He's putting me on edge, isn't he? <laughs> 
Stefan, are you with us now? You're still muted. Ah, uh, okay. So here you are. I Oh, oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, for giving me the chance. And thank you very much, Professor Skinner, for your extremely rich and insightful uh, picture, not only of the English uh, history of ideas, but uh, even of the English legal history. I especially um, found your distinction between infringements of liberties and taking away the status of a person. Uh, helpful. Yeah. Um, I think this is, this is very uh, important. However, uh, I was a bit surprised uh, from yesterday's uh, presentation, but also from yours, that the concept of positive freedom has not been introduced. Now, I'm well familiar that uh, since perhaps Constant and, and especially uh, Gisela Berlin, um, positive uh, uh, freedom has the connotation of uh, being a collectivist and not an individualist concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you not only speak about the infringement, the domination of this or that liberty, but if you introduce the concept of the status of person, mm. persona or prosopon, um, and especially if we speak of prosopon, we have to look at the other side of the mask. Not only what does not dominate or should not dominate, but what are the motives, what are the drives of this person, and what is her will to give herself the laws for her action, her autonomy, namely. Yes. So I, I would be very happy if you could you elaborate a little bit uh, on your reluctance uh, to introduce the concept of positive freedom. Well, thank you, Stefan. That's a really deep question and very interesting to have it. But where are you speaking from? Oh, sorry, I didn't say so. Um, I'm speaking from Heidelberg, Germany. Well, I know where Heidelberg is. Um, I have even lectured there, <laughs> but not much, uh -huh. I have to say. <laughs> well, uh, nice to be there. Well, my goodness, you have some connections with the Stuart monarchy in Heidelberg, don't you? In the castle. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. Indeed. Very astonishing. I found the, 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 the British coat, royal coat of arms in Heidelberg at the last time I was there. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. the yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, wonderful. Welcome. Um, well, this is a very important point. Um, and it, it isn't one that the, the, the classical version of the, uh, the view of freedom that I've talked about is unaware of. Um, but it, it might be said to reject it. Um, and I think your question is, well, should we be rejecting it? You could say this. If we think of freedom in positive terms, I mean, in, in a Hegelian way, I mean, let, let's go to the, the real fount of this. Um, it, it is that negative liberty, uh, understood um, by Hegel uh, in the neo-Roman way, is simply the negative moment of the dialectic. Uh, and we have to complete the dialect to, to understand how to think about freedom, because this says I'm free if I'm not dominated. Well, there's the negative moment of the dialectic in order to do what Hegel wants to be answered with a really deep account of what it is to be human. And freedom is, well, then, of course, the neo-Hegelians in the English tradition, I think of someone like T.H. Green, who's, who's working so much with the philosophy of right. Um, wants to say, well, it, freedom is actually the name of a positive moral achievement. It is becoming what you have in it yourself to be. And there's the Hegelian thought. That's the positive moment of the dialectic. And that, it is, that is what it is to be free. You, you have achieved what you can become. Now, the... The jurists are not unaware of that, but what they don't like the look of is that their view is, you know, quotes, I mean, Cicero, what is it to be a liber homo? Vivere ut venus, live as you wish. That's freedom, live as you want. They are very concerned not to police this and to say, well, actually, we've got to give this a positive content and we've got to say what that content is. 
And Hegel doesn't, of course, but Hegelians do. And if you take a modern Hegelian like Charles Taylor in the Anglophone tradition, then he actually fills it out. And he says, um, the, the highest aspiration of humankind is to serve the, the public good. And that is what it is to be really free, is to devote yourself to public service in such a way that there is a general benefit to your community. That's, that's freedom freedom. And of course, recognizably, a Christian story is echoing behind this. His ser God's service is yeah. freedom. God's service is freedom. But maybe not God, but maybe the people. But anyway, there's the positivity. All I can say is, yes, I didn't go into that. Uh, I, I don't share Isaiah Berlin's view that, and of course, we're talking here about his second concept of liberty, aren't we? Although he never, I think, got that very clear, whether it was self-mastery or whether it was becoming what you could be. He, he never clarifies mm -hmm. that. But somewhere along the line, he thought something very sinister was happening because I'm not quite sure why it was so sinister. It was because people were being told that freedom had a certain content and that was shaping them. And then because freedom was a moralized notion, it could be used for totalitarian purposes. That's roughly the way the argument goes. That's not the best part of his, uh, his lecture. But there's something there which certainly in Roman law they would like, which is we don't moralize this notion. Uh, wh what you're left with is whatever you want. Thank you. And uh, the next uh, question is from Professor Joshua Kastner. Hello, Hello Joshua. Uh, Hello, Professor Skinner. Oh, I wasn't quite sure the screen hadn't changed yet. No, um, you, I can see you um, very well, and you've got a very handsome clock behind you as well. That, that's um, inherited from my grandmother, who, who won it at a church fair maybe 30 or 40 years ago. Um, uh, where are you thanks, speaking from, Joshua? I'm actually a professor of philosophy at the University of Baltimore, but I'm currently oh. in Connecticut. Right. Um, so it's a, I was, I was in attendance for, for Professor Pettit's lecture last night, which was fantastic, um, but had to come home uh, for family duties uh, today. Um, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed your lecture and I have a number of questions. Um, and, and in part, the, the one question I've sort of settled on, I don't wanna, I don't wanna bias your answer in any way, uh, but it relates a bit to Professor Trujillo's question. And it also ties into one of the last comments you made in your conclusion about one of the biggest threats being social media. And one of the things that strikes me, and I, I spoke to Professor Pettit about this last night, was um, there's a way in which the, the business model, for lack of a, a better way of putting it, uh, for social media companies works, where um, it's, it's not even a kind of um, interference or a, a type of uh, control in, in what, I, what I think of, we think of as sort of like an orthodox sense, but rather if we think of the way that algorithms um, manipulate our cognitive deficiencies or confirmation bias. Um, mm. Yeah. But, Right, so in that instance, they're actually um, feeding us things that fit within our first order preferences. Mm. And, and, and I would just like to get your reaction to that. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you can probably already, um, you know what I'm hinting towards, uh, but it's about what does, that, what does that say about our freedom? Yeah. Either either in the, the libertarian sense or in the, the Republican sense or in the neo-Republican sense? Well, thank you, Joshua. Uh, that is not a point I raised, but um, it, it is an extremely important one, feeding preferences, um, uh, uh, um, working your way into biases. Well, all of this, um, as I said in, in, in my 
talk, uh, I, I just remember um, saying this now, is I don't want to sound paranoid about this. And of course, there would be a big cost-benefit analysis to be done on the social media platforms. Um, and obviously, people are making, a, it's very generational, uh, younger people have made much more of a cost-benefit analysis, which has come out on the side of the benefits. Um, I don't mean to be paranoid about the the cost, but the cost is that you subject yourself to a form of power um, over which you have no control. And the power comes forward. And I mean, I, I watched Facebook perform in front of the Senate committee and they say, we're good people, we're good guys. You know, wh where's your problem? We, we are good guys. Um, the question, the, what they don't get is the counterfactuality of this. The question is not what are they doing? The question is what they could do. And that's the neo-Roman point. What could be done with all of this data? And I guess I'll put my cards on the table a little bit more. Um, I, I saw that as a, in another instance of a, a, a distinction between the liberty as non-interference and liberty as non-domination, where I, I, my, my intuition is that liberty as non-interference has very little to say about the that kind of that's that's absolutely my point yeah i mean my one of my main criticisms of liberal thinking about the mess we're all currently in now is that the liberal construction is very bad at thinking about silent power because everything is on the surface and the question is is there some act of interference well that's a question about identifying some process that's gone on or some action that's been taken or some obstruction um, and all of that, as you might say, on the surface, uh, the, the phrase I, I try to use all through my talk is, I mean, think about silent power, the power of the master. It's not counterfactual, this power, although it may never be exercised. It, it is a real form of power, but it's completely silent. And, and Philip wrote, a, uh, Pellet wrote a, a beautiful piece about this, um, which I alluded to at the end of my own talk about the silent power of very rich corporations investing in very poor states. It's, they don't have to say anything. It's all understood. But what is understood? It's understood who is here master. And you don't question the master. I mean, that's what you don't do. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think so the Zuboff book, by the way, on surveillance capitalism is a masterpiece. And it is not paranoid, but it is really scary we've hardly started to get into all of this but her book is is just spectacular on this very matter so we have time i think for three more questions um, and we're going to take professor gaedeke professor lovett and professor rousselier in, in, in that order so i call on professor dorothea gaedeke Can you hear me? I certainly can, Dorothea. Well, You've thank you for that. Where are you? I, I'm in Utrecht at home. You where? I'm in Utrecht in, in, in the Utrecht. Netherlands. At home. I, unfortunately, I couldn't make it to Baltimore. <laughs> I did try, though. <laughs> um, but thank you so very I much. Think also, Anneline was coming from Utrecht, wasn't she? Well, she's based at the moment in the US, as far as I know, for this year. Oh, right. Uh, I think she's not actually been able to come. But uh, anyway, she's a colleague of yours. Yes, yes, she is. Yes. <laughs> I hadn't seen her in Utrecht recently, though. I thought she had actually gone to the US, but I'm, I'm not sure. About well, that. I mean, she hadn't this morning. I had an email from her. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, in your fantastic lecture, you, you very um, helpfully and, um, and made it very clear how important it is to distinguish between freedom of action and freedom of the person. And so I wondered whether you could say a little bit more on how you see the relation between the two, so between freedom of action and freedom of the person. And I'm asking this because at the end of your talk, you, when you talked about the economic dependence of women, you said this economic dependence restricts their freedom of choice. And that made me wonder whether the status, of the, uh, the status as a free person matters because its denial 
entails a restriction of freedom of action or freedom of choice, right. or whether it is restrictions of freedom of action are only, let's say, one way in which a denial of citizenship as a free person manifests itself. So to put the, the question a bit more generally, um, I'd ask, do we need the idea of freedom of action to spell out what the freedom of the person means and why it matters? Now, this is really deep, very interesting indeed. Um, I, I would also love Philip Pettit from his wonderful talk yesterday evening to come in on our discussion here, because Philip doesn't in that lecture talk about freedom of action. He talks about freedom of choice. Um, now, of course, if you can't choose freely, you can't act freely. So we can see that there's an intimate connection there. It is quite interesting that the, the classical formulation never talks about choice. I mean, it, it could do. I mean, the Latin verbs meaning to choose, optari, elegare, uh, they never use this vocabulary. They always choose the vocabulary of doing something. Are you able, vivere libret, I mean, to, 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 to live freely, or facere, uh, do things. It's always about action. Now, um, what I want to say, I mean, first of all, I would really like to, uh, to um, reflect a little bit on that. Maybe we could get Philip to come in on this. Um, here's the point, however, that, that the, 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 pure, the pure Roman story, which I'm trying to give you, wants to say is let's forget about action. Because the, the issue for freedom is, are you a free person? Now, a, a free person, of course, is someone who is free to choose and free to act. Um, but th th the freedom that they have stems from the fact that there is no exercise of silent power over them. So what really matters is not action. What matters is having that standing. You are not subject to any form of silent power. And, and that's, what they, that's what they really want you to say. Now, you, you might say, well, um, isn't freedom of choice or freedom of action more important, not being interfered with? You might, you might completely reject the, this story that I'm telling and say, look, I don't think that this is what matters for freedom. I think what matters for freedom is not being interfered with, not having this particular status of not being subject to silent power. I, I mean, that would be... I haven't heard, heard anyone say that, but, you know, that would be a possible position. That would be absolutely to repudiate what I've been saying is the fundamental thought of the neo-Roman tradition, which is forget about all this stuff about, of course, you, you know, someone might stop you doing something. That's not the point. The point is, are you a free person? And why is that the point? Because if you're not a free person, then you never choose in that freedom, because there's always the silent power. Philip, I see you now. Do you have anything to say to Dorothea about um, choice and action? Well, very briefly, the reason I use choice is that in English, um, you can describe an action as free when it's voluntary. And as we all know from Harry Frankfurt's work, yeah. uh, you can act voluntarily and in that sense uh, be held responsible for so acting, act freely as it's often put, even when, had you tried to do the alternative, you wouldn't have been able to do it, but yeah. you didn't know that. And so you wouldn't have freedom of choice in that sort of case. So there's a choice between going left or going right. You think you've got the choice, actually you'd be stopped going right if you chose that way. Yeah. But you think about it and you choose, you choose to go to the left, so you're not obstructed. You did it voluntarily. You could be held responsible for doing it. But you did not have, though you didn't realize that, you did not have freedom of choice in the social freedom sense yeah. of having both options open to you. One option was a closed door. On the, on the broader issue, uh, I mean, it, it would be interesting to continue this discussion further, but I shouldn't take up too much time. But very briefly, I think that uh, the, the connection, and I think, the same is true for you, Quentin, between being a free person and having freedom of choice or action, if you wish to call it that in the appropriate sense, is that, of course, 
to be a free person doesn't mean that you're free to do just about anything. No. I mean, you're not free to go around killing people. You don't cease to be a free person because you're under that freedom. Yes. And that's why, as I presented last night, and I think this goes right, right back actually in my own work, uh, I think that you have to have an independent way of identifying the basic choices in which non-domination matters, in which it matters that there isn't power over you, silent or otherwise, um, that's exercised over you. And so you have to have some way of picking out the basic, uh, the basic liberties. And yeah. I think the natural way of doing that is to uh, think of them as the sorts of liberties that everyone could equally enjoy consistently with other people enjoying them at the same time, yeah. uh, where they're not unnecessarily restricted. And I mean, I'd love to hear Quentin on this further, but my sense is that the Romans had something like that in mind when they oh, talked about yeah. libertates, as in the liberty absolutely. rather than liberty with the big L. Actually, I think that runs all through the tradition and both in the, in the two great revolutions, which are legitimized exactly in neo-Roman terms, that's to say the English revolution of the 17th century, the American revolution of the 18th century. This is absolutely fundamental, co-enjoyable rights. Yes, that, that, those are the Republican revolutions rather than the neo-Roman revolutions. I think you'd agree. <laughs> well, that's true. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Dorothea. Thank you. <laughs> the, the next question is from Professor Frank Lovett. Hi. And I don't think, Professor Skinner, you can see me because I'm off to the side here. <clears throat> I can um, hear you, though, Frank. It's very okay. good to see you. With that, oh, should I? They're, they're saying I should scooch over. So I'm. <clears throat> uh, this question, it's more of a, a history question. So it might be, it's not quite as profound as I suppose the. Ones we've been talking no, about. history is the most profound discipline. <laughs> okay, good. Well, that gives me courage to. Um, <laughs> I, wanted, I was hope, thinking you could maybe say a little bit more about um, license. Um, as you referred to license in Locke as essentially being. Um, these weren't quite your words, but but freedom misused or something like mm, that. Mm -hmm. um, and you've commented several times that the the, the jurists sort of didn't worry about that. Um, but I, I have sort of detected in the Republican writings a different way of thinking about license. And I was just wondering what you thought about it. Um, and people like Price and uh, Sidney and I think Adam and Milton too, um, they have this idea of license as being able to do what you want um, a view they associate with Hobbes and Filmer sometimes. Yes. Um, and in fact, uh, have this idea that it's not, um, it's not misused freedom. It's just, if you're allowed, they actually think that it's inimical to freedom uh, yeah. if people can do what they want too much. And I, I think this goes, may go back to an argument in Machiavelli that um, securing freedom requires a certain kind of discipline of civic virtue. And if yeah. you let people just do what they want, uh, it can undermine social order and, and undermine the, the security of, of freedom in the strong sense. And that's a different, that's not quite the um, license uh, as you were talking about it, as it appears in Locke. Um, no, that is true. Yes. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, my impression um, from the, especially from the 18th century texts, uh, and uh, there we would want to include um, Locke, just about, I think, but certainly in um, later 18th century discussions, which are Whig discussions, that's to say they're pro-governmental discussions, uh, license that worries them is licentiousness. It's something quite specific. It, it is that, you know, if the people have too much freedom, they're going to, um, everything you see in Hogarth, I mean, there you see um, envisage the distinction between freedom and license. You give them their freedom and what do they do? They drink gin all day um, or, you know, they, um, they have sex all the time. I mean, or the, there's great anxiety about the mob and the license, the license of the mob is its licentiousness. But so that I think is the specific anxiety. And that is, of course, they want to say is not freedom. Why not? Well, because then that does take you back, I think, to something that um, Locke would be a very good example of, which is um, the, the, the intimate connection between freedom and reason. 
that what it is to act freely is to act according to the dictates of reason. And what you must not become is a slave to the passions. Now, of course, that's a much more general claim. You could be a slave to all manner of the passions because uh, many of the vices, many of the passions are vices. Uh, so there could be a whole list of the deadly sins which give rise to the wrong forms of action. But what they want to do is what the jurists are not interested in doing at all is to say, well, you, you know, you, you can't just say vivere ut velis, as Cicero does, you know, li, you know do whatever you want. You, you can't say that with the mob. They're terrified of the mob. Uh, and it's, it's the licentiousness of their license, I think, which usually terrifies them. Our uh, final question uh, today will be from Professor Geneviève Rousselier, and um, she also... <laughs> and she is also attending remotely, so it'll take just a moment. Bonjour. Hello. Bonjour. Bonjour. Um, um, okay, so I'm speaking from uh, New York City. Um, oh. Yeah. How disappointing. I'm, yeah. I thought you in Marseille. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, my question is also about history. Um, you mentioned that uh, the concept of neo Roman uh, freedom uh, starts losing favor by the end of the 18th century and is replaced um, by the concept of freedom as non interference. And um, there are other people who have this thesis, such as Philip Petit, I know. And so I was wondering if you could explain this. And my, uh, my, my question is, um, is about the fact that this is also, of course, the moment when the great uh, Republican tradition in France, in Germany, in, in the US, sort of start shaping and rising. And why are they excluded from uh, this narrative? And so could you explain why um, you are not analyzing the French Republican tradition uh, as a continuity or transformation of um, this neo-Roman um, concept yeah. of freedom. Well, yeah, very good. I mean, I did confess that um, I was I was told to speak for only forty minutes, and so I there was an anglophone bias. There's no question there was an anglophone bias. Um, Obviously, there are three great revolutions which are legitimized entirely in neo-Roman terms, and they are the English Revolution, uh, the American Revolution, and, of course, the French Revolution. What happens in England, um, and indeed generally, after 1789, is an absolute horror of what has happened in France on the part of um, more conservative social forces. This is very important in England. There's absolute panic about the French Revolution. And what that means is there's panic about neo-Roman liberty because the legitimization of the revolution is in terms of uh, a liberty which goes with equality. That's to say equal freedom, liberté, égalité. Um, and the, the liberty is not, being not, not having a monarchy. You can't be free under a monarchy. That's what they first of all want to say in 1789. Um, so, of course, the, the, the story continues in France. Not for very long, though, I have to say, because the, the revolution mutates into to Bonapartism. But what has happened meanwhile is that what puts paid to the hegemony of the neo-Roman view in English law is the American Revolution. Because they've got the American Revolution is also legitimized in term, in neo-Roman terms, and that's got to be contested. So how do you contest the legitimization of the American and French revolutions? And if you were going to, I was going to talk under the heading the nemesis of republican liberty, because this is the nemesis of republican liberty. You need a really powerful answer to the American and the French revolutions. And that is what's given. Um, in, in natural jurisprudence. And the natural jurisprudence especially is a German tradition, of course, um, but is taken up very much in England, is then used to denounce first the American and then the French revolutions. And it's very, very counter-revolutionary. And as opposed to being contractarian, I mean, Rousseau terrifies them, 
as opposed to any form of contractarianism, what it says is, look, what you have to realize is that the state of nature is a state of war. And there's no, there's, there can be nothing but government. And it has to be absolute, it has to be an absolute sovereign and you have to submit. And that is the line that's taken all the way through conservative natural law. I mean, if I were to give you, since we're finishing, um, a, a huge conspectus, it would be to say that this is the debate which has divided Europe, um, Western Europe, uh, ever since the mid 16th century, ever since the Reformation. The Reformation breaks up the state because it breaks up the unity of the state with religion and you, you get religious wars. How can you overcome religious wars? That's the question. And of course, the religious wars are fought in the name of a neo-Roman view of liberty, which is that the, the, the people are secessionists, the vindicia contra tyrannos, you know, there we are, um, a, a vindication against tyranny. That's to say, um, we are not submitting to the state. The state is a contracted arrangement between the people and a ruler who will be removed if he doesn't do what the parliament requires. There's got to be an answer to that because that's destroying Europe. And the answer that comes out of the conservative natural law tradition in England with Hobbes, but above all Pufendorf reading Hobbes, and then the great Pufendorfian tradition, Tomasius, Bulamaki, Aineckius, Barberak, and then back to England with Blackstone. It all says, face it, the state is inevitable. Don't talk to us about the state of nature and natural rights. There's no such thing. There's only the state and you're a subject. And that's, of course, what gets wheeled out against the French Revolution as well. So I see this dialectic running all the way through. And I'm afraid I was I was focusing on one side of it. But the country which <laughs> does best to hold out is, of course, France. Um, but not for long after 1789, because that horrifies Europe altogether. And as it were, you know, Europe then teams up against the French Revolution, doesn't it? The British go to war almost immediately. That's a rather expansive reply to your question, Genevieve, but uh, you tap into what I think of as the, the uh, absolutely fundamental um, fracturing of the theory of the state in early modern Europe and, and this attempt to put it together again. The climax of which, of course, is Hegel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Skinner, for that extremely uh, powerful conclusion to your remarks for a wonderful lecture and to an extremely powerful, perceptive and convincing conclusion. And uh, now all we can do is applaud. <laughs> well, I hope I'm still online to thank you all very much. May I just say a, a final word of thanks to the Dean for his very gracious opening to Tim Sellers for organizing it and to Gerard Schuster and all the other technical expertise that's gone into making this all possible. Uh, I've enjoyed it enormously. And thank you also, Philip, for a spectacular talk yesterday evening. I always expect it of you, but it's always a joy when it comes. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you and goodbye.